From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. The summer seems to be flying by. It's hard to believe, but school starts soon for students across the Treasure Valley and across the state. August 16th or 17th are the start dates for many districts. That means a lot of parents are out running around getting their last minute back to school shopping done. Teachers are working on their lesson plans and state education leaders are enacting their plans, programs and policies for the 2023-24 school year. The Idaho State Department of Education says 319,000 students attended public schools in 117 districts during the 2022-23 school year. Roughly the same number, as well as about 19,000 teachers will start school this year, several months after the state legislature and Governor Brad Little made large investments in public education. They approved investing $410 million of the state's record $1.6 billion budget surplus into public education. That includes $80 million for the Idaho Launch Program. That provides $8,000 grant to qualifying Idaho high school seniors to use at any Idaho community college, career technical program, or workforce training program for jobs that are in high demand in the state. They increased pay for all teachers, including bumping up starting teacher pay to more than $47,000 a year. The governor says that puts Idaho in the top 10 nationally for starting teacher salaries. The legislature also increased funding for public schools by 16.4% and made the Empowering Parents Grant program permanent. That program provides help to eligible families to pay for things such as computers, internet access, instructional materials, and tutoring. So teacher pay, school funding, and the funding formula, as well as curriculum remain the big topics heading into the school year. My guest today is the head of the State Department of Education overseeing all of this stuff. She is Superintendent of Public Instruction, Debbie Critchfield. Debbie, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. So I do have to ask, why do schools start so early in Idaho? <laughs> well, it looks differently because those are local decisions. Mm -hmm. However, with that said, there's a couple of factors that go into a local district choosing when they're going to start and, and end their school year. One is the fact that the state sets the bare minimum hours of, of seat time, um, how much time the student needs to be in school. And then many districts may choose to go above and beyond that. They may have more contract days for their, their teachers and another district, and so it, it will look a little bit different. I know in the case of many of our big districts here in the Treasure Valley, they're looking uh, to align the end of their school semester uh, with the end of December, which will mean they've got to crunch in a few more days at the mm -hmm. front end so that they can also then get out a little bit earlier than normal. Okay, so going into this school year then, what do you see as the big issue, the big priority? Well, I think uh, the, the legislature, as you um, commented and stated in your opening, there were some significant um, changes in funding going to our schools to address some of the hiring that we have. So we're hoping that that will be less of an issue. It, it still is always an issue mm -hmm. as we compete within the workforce and for salary and benefit packages. But hopefully it, it's a side burner, not the front burner issue. Um, I am so, I guess, excited and also um, satisfied in hearing districts really talk about learning. We, I feel like the, the COVID years, those pandemic years are really in that rear view mirror. Um, as I visit with schools and talk with superintendents, they're not at all discussing any kind of changes that have to do with logistics, but now the real focus on is on learning outcomes. And, and that's where we want it to be. Let's talk about the teacher pay raises and keeping good teachers, um, recruiting good teachers has been a challenge over the years here. Teacher shortage has been talked about for a long time with those pay increases, is it too early to have seen a difference or are you now seeing a difference already with uh, the starting salaries and the overall teacher pay increases with people staying or coming to the state? I, I think that it, it could be both things. I, we're certainly gonna get more information as we go through this coming school year, but I think one early piece of evidence that it, it is something that is helping um, within the profession to att attract and retain educators is we're hearing that there are less teacher positions that are open. Mm. There are many districts that are still scrambling to fill, you know, we're still trying to fill bus driver positions and, and some of these other things, but I'm hearing less districts talk about the actual teacher shortage. Now we also talked about you know all the hundreds of millions of dollars that were put into uh, public school funding. How can districts use that money? It's you know a big boost. Well, as as we've been talking about, a, a big chunk of that will go to salaries. Uh, we also know that a, a portion of that was slated for school safety. 
and uh, we also uh, look at other ways with insurance benefits there was monies um, that are uh, dedicated for that and then outside of those uh, those areas it goes into a, a local district's budget and then they sit down uh, the board gets together with their superintendent and they determine what the priorities for their district are because local control is always a big it, it is, and, and we're, and we're going to wave the flag for that. Um, and, and I think from the state level, we help support good decision making at the local level by providing them resources, by providing them information so that they can make the best decisions possible. There's been a lot of talk uh, recently about whether schools or school funding should be based on attendance versus enrollment. You know, during uh, the COVID pandemic and so much learning from home, it switched to that enrollment number. Mm -hmm. Now, though, since that's over, it's switched back to attendance based. So there could be a difference, you know, in, in the numbers of how many kids are actually sure. in school, in the seats. And Where do we, you stand on well, that? Well, and, and, and we're, we're, we're seeing that. We're, we're speculating and projecting what that, that gap will be. So I, I think that there are two important sides to this issue. The enrollment piece is important for our school districts because regardless of, you know, if you have 30 kids that are in that class and you, you know, you're only maybe 28 show up that day because somebody's at home, there are still fixed costs. We're still paying the, the heat, we're still running the lights, we're still running the bus routes, we're still doing all of those things. And, and I know that that's the predictability and that certainty part of the budgeting that our school districts are looking for that they liked about enrollment. The other side of that is equally important. We want kids in their seats. We want schools to create environments. We want them to take notice of, of who's missing that day and, and reach out and make sure that our, our kids are, are getting to school. And so as we contemplate where we go from here and modernize funding for our districts, I believe that we can um, capture both sides of that important equation. And let's talk about that too. Kevin Richard with uh, Ed Idaho Education News recently reported that you're heading up this effort to basically rewrite uh, the funding funding formula for K-12 public schools. Um, why is that necessary? Well, we've been eyeing changes as a state. I use the kind of the royal we here. Uh, many people have been looking at this for a number of years, really specifically for, but with, with our pandemic years and, and looking at that, I think it highlighted some of those gaps and some of those areas where we need to do better. You look through um, statute, which is Title 33 um, in, in Idaho code and Idaho law. We look through that and many of those things have been in the books um, since the 60s and more recently Recently, early 2000s, um, there was a, a breakup in you know in what that looked like. Well, certainly in the last 20-ish years, uh, we're we're operating differently. Things are more expensive. There are different needs in different ways. And so, listening to that as a superintendent, listening and uh, taking in help from our education uh, partners, from our governor, from the legislature, I, I think we're at a really great place to say we have enough information to know that we're just not quite where we need to be in, in providing the needs for our schools, what should that look like? Is this a rural versus urban discussion? It, it can be. Um, there, there's no doubt that it costs more in different places to educate a kid than it does in others. You have the, the economies of scale in a larger district maybe, you know, or a consolidated district only as one transportation person and you know some of they, they share things um, for our rural districts that can be more challenging I would say across the board as we look at this return to attendance um, that we've identified there is money that would be left on the table because we're going back to a formula rather than there's one student enrolled here's the money that you get for the student mm. well with attendance we it, it's math it's complicated math. do you want it to be enrollment is that what the, the rewrites? Um, no, actually, I you know I I want it. Uh, I want to say that there is certainty that we know that you're going to get money to educate the kids that are there. But we must incentivize, and we must have some sort of a, a program where we're asking our districts to take a look at attendance. We, we want parents to be engaged in that. Uh, we want the local leaders, and and so as I look at you know where we go from here. I, I can see that there are a number of places that we can make some improvements so that as the legislature appropriates these incredible, uh, incredible amount of money that our districts are able to access that.
that, that's the, that's what I'm looking for in the plan. So I understand that you have to, you know, make your budget request by September 1st. Yes. The number is something like $2.7 billion that's public all. education yeah. budget. That's all. Um, what's your focus there? What's the, the top priority for you in that? Well, we're, we're doing this work in a very aggressive schedule uh, with our, our funding group that we've got together, a working group. And my, my plan is to get to a consensus place and that that becomes the budget that I submit in September but then present to our Joint Finance Committee in January. Rather than, here's the old way we've been doing it, but here's the way we wanna do it. Come forward with the plan that we believe works moving forward. We just saw this past week that the uh, first grants to, to schools for career technical education were awarded. Um, is that new and then and what's the, the, the the key in that program. It is new. This is something um, that I was able to work with our, our governor and the legislature to, to get a $45 million grant available for our schools to use to promote um, a real regional and community approach to satisfying career technical needs. And so as we get the council stood up, they met for the first time, and we, we went through what what's our goal here? And, and the goal is to remove the barriers that have existed, provide opportunities for local decision making. It's going to look very different. The needs in the north part of the state for students are very different than in the east or in the south. And, and, and I believe that this is an opportunity uh, for, for some really great programs to be created. I believe one of the schools that was awarded is using however much money they got to buy like 29 computers to be able to for one of their specific programs. Yes, so involved in their accounting program, which is a technical it's Hansen, program. I think. Yes, yeah. in Hanson. And those types of computers to do the Microsoft suite so that their students can have certifications, which is a marketable skill. It's a transferable ability that as you leave high school and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, uh, and maybe you know, maybe you don't, but either way, I can go get a job because I now have something that says I am good at this skill. Yeah, I want to talk about one other grant program. That's the Empowering Parents Grant program that was made permanent. Um, parents can use that for supplies and technology for their kids. Mm -hmm. Um, how is that going? How's the interest been in that? Well, it, it's been a tremendously successful program, and right now I'm, I'm chairing the Empowering Parents panel that's a part of the process of refining and taking a look at it. And so we've got seven uh, people from around the state that are um, taking a look at what categories, what should be allowable expenses, and how do we um, make this easy for Idahoans and for parents around the state. All right, we're gonna take a break now as we speak with Debbie Critchfield, Superintendent of Public Instruction. When we come back, we'll focus on some of the curriculum and social issues swirling around our public education system. Is your credit score getting in the way of the things you want to do? Personal loans through NetCredit offer fast and flexible lending. Borrow up to $10,000 and choose repayment terms that work for you. You may even be able to build your credit history as you repay. NetCredit, a more personal, personal loan. Toyota's national sales event is on. Make the most of summer with a new Toyota. We want the great Tacoma. Great Tacoma coming in hot. On it. Highlander Hybrid. Highlander Hybrid on the double hang. Here we go. That Red Rav 4. Run a Red Rav 4. Hit the deck. Now that's how you holler. Every new Toyota comes with Toyota Care, our no-cost maintenance plan with roadside assistance. Visit your local Toyota dealer to learn more. Reserve yours at toyota.com. Come in today. Toyota, let's go places. At California Closets, we believe every space deserves a custom solution. From the consultation to the final installation, every detail was buttoned up and very professional. That's what we call practical magic. Request a free design consultation. Hungry Root is here. And I needed it because my fridge is super empty. I'm going to open the box. That's the exciting part. Hungry Root came through. And my refrigerator is packed. Olympia's fifth grade orchestra. Perhaps there's no place like your home because you made it so at RC Willie. This stock weather app can't make up its mind. Some things are best left for local experts. KTVB's first alert weather team of local meteorologists track the most accurate forecasts so you can leave the house with confidence. Trust the first alert weather team. Trust Idaho's News Channel 7. 
Welcome back to Viewpoint. Today we're focusing on the big issues in public education in Idaho heading into the new school year. We've touched on funding, teacher pay, grants for students to go on for training in high demand fields, and grants for parents to buy critical educational supplies for their kids. Now we'll turn to some other issues affecting schools that aren't necessarily tied to money. Once again, my guest is State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Debbie Critchfield. Uh, Debbie, if you and the governor um, unveiled a new plan called uh, the story of America. It's new. A lot of people don't know much about it. What is it? It's a supplementary curriculum for teachers who teach uh, history, social studies grades 8 through 11. It's an online resource optional for teachers. The beauty of it is a local district doesn't have to go and, and expend their own resources. Teachers are already trying to find uh, additional ways to talk about a subject or a concept. And so when, when we, the governor and I, uh, were able to, to get a hold of this and take a look at it, we thought this is a perfect way to help our teachers in the classrooms and uh, provide an additional way for students to really have a deeper look at some of these mm -hmm. things. It's interactive, it's designed to catch their attention, it's media based, and just the ease of having it in the classroom, I think it makes a perfect tool for teachers. Uh, new, so questions will arise. Um, former Education Secretary Bill Bennett developed the curriculum and was quoted as saying, for too long, an anti-America ideology that radically misrepresents U.S. history has infiltrated our education system and misled our kids, hence why he developed this. But do you hear that concern from Idahoans? I actually have. You know, I, I have heard it uh, from parents and from community members. And I think that it is um, a result of perhaps not understanding what is in the classroom currently. I think it's also a result of schools not having the, the funds to go and update books that are 20 years old on the shelf. That they're expensive. Curriculum adoptions are expensive uh, tickets uh, and, and price tags in, in our, in our uh, school districts. And so as, as we hear the concern of what are our kids learning about and how are they learning this, this provides, again, an opportunity. It's optional for teachers to have something rather than this one-dimensional, here's the book that you have, and we're going to talk about World War II in 20 pages. There's so much more to that. Perhaps the teacher wants the pictures, the video, the, the first-hand account, someone's voice. They're able to bring that in. Is it whitewashing history, the story of America? No, not at all. Um, and and I, I know what, what folks mean when they say that. Um, th this is about enhancing, enhancing the instruction that's there. It's about a deeper look at some of these. I think it's just a, a, more, a way to provide more color to what we know and believe to be history. So it covers slavery, Jim Crow Abs laws, absolutely. Reconstruction, absolutely. women's rights. Yes, well. it, it, it's, it's not a rewrite. And um, as we get the information out to teachers and, and we, you know, we'll share what's on there and, and have things available for other people. You know, if, if we were trying to hide something, we wouldn't give everyone logins and say, go take a look and use, use this information. Um, we're excited about it and, and I think teachers will find it useful. And again, it's a supplemental thing that Supplement. teachers can yep. choose. It's not designed to be the primary curriculum. Okay. So if I'm, you know, if I'm in the classroom and I'm in, you know, in the 11th grade and, and you're, my teacher is going to talk to me about a particular subject, the Civil War, or World War II, whatever it is, uh, rather than just read those few paragraphs, she's able to use the technology in her classroom to say, look at this snippet, look at these okay. pictures, look at this primary document that, that would not be available in the textbook that they have. Um, just this last legislative session also on uh, the so-called bathroom bill um, requiring all public schools to maintain bathrooms and changing rooms on the basis of biological sex, the sex a person was assigned at birth or they could possibly face fines. You did your legislative you know, roadshow tour. You talk to leaders all the time. What are you hearing from districts about implementing that policy? The only thing that, that we have heard uh, from most districts has been a little bit of a relief that now there is a backstop at the state level. Many of our districts had these policies in place already. And, and I, I want to make sure that, you know, that we're clear that we're not limiting or excluding any child or student from using a, from using a bathroom. But what, what the law says is that um, you use the bathroom that to the, the gender that you were born to and that there is another bathroom available if you're not comfortable in that setting. And, and to, be, to be honest, many of our schools, and we, we think back to when we were in school ourselves, 
the, the bathroom isn't just about the transgender issue. Bullying can take place in the bathrooms. Many of our, our students have you know, other body issues that they're concerned with. We don't put cameras in bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are other reasons that other students may want to use a private bathroom. And, and so this, this puts in code and allows districts to set these policies that are um, protecting all students and um, gives them an ability to say, we can do this because we saw districts that were being sued all over. Well, you can't do that. You can't decide that. You know, the, the local control issue was completely um, trumped. And so in this case, what we have heard are, are districts coming back and saying, oh, yay, now there's some uniformity provided at the state level. So, you know, we see um, the bathroom bill used to have, you know, the debate last year over pulling books off of library shelves that some felt were inappropriate um, and other issues like that. You talked earlier about you know, the leaders talking to you saying that they're able to focus on education this year. With those issues though, and they'll probably come back up again, do you worry about the politicization of the classroom? Every day, <laughs> absolutely. And, and I do believe that social issues are more on the forefront or at the forefront of many of our educational discussions and topics. And, and some of those things that were discussed this, this year's legislative session, I have full confidence will come back. Uh, what I have seen are districts react to that to say, well, if legislation was discussed to do it like this or here are the concerns, how do we respond to that in our local community? So using the, the library bill as an example. Which I've, the governor vetoed, by Correct. Yeah. I, I have talked to so many districts that have gone back and had discussions in their communities to say, how do you want to do this? What, what should the policies and procedures look like if a parent has a concern about a, a book on a shelf? Um, there was a, a superintendent that I spoke with the other day that said, hey, I've got 130 books on my desk. There were books that were brought to the, the attention of him and the board to say, well, you know, parents weren't sure. And, and so they're going to go through their process. And I think that that's what we want to drive towards is that the, the best decisions are made at the local level and that, you know, we, we don't have one parent coming in and, and making those decisions for every other parent in the community. Now, I'm speaking specifically of public K-12 schools. I know there's another side of this where you know, public libraries have library districts right. of, of elected people. But I've also heard that they're putting uh, different procedures into place on, you know, what the library card looks like. You know, this child's under 18, therefore there's some more scrutiny there. So I, I believe that there has been a, a, a considerable amount of work that's happened and on that specific issue. We can't anticipate every issue that will rise to the top, but I think being prepared, um, and particularly for me at the state level, uh, to be hearing what, what's being talked about in different places around the state and how do we get in front of those to help solve problems. Um, we just have a minute left. I wanna get you know, a final thought from you. Uh, I've talked to so many kids, and, so, and my nephews included, who lived through COVID. They did, weren't able to graduate, and you know that was just so disruptive. Going into your first full school year as superintendent, what are your hopes for 23-24? I want us to get back to the meaning of education. I want to restore the value of education and, and what that means. I want our teachers to find meaning in their roles. I want our students to show up to school and find the relevance of what they're doing there. I want our parents to have confidence in what's happening as they you know, ship their child off on the bus or, or drop them off every day. And I want our local leaders to feel as though they have um, the ability, which they do, we want to emphasize the ability that they have to make the decisions that get us to that result, that our communities feel good about our schools. It's getting started in just a couple of weeks. It is. It's <laughs> exciting. So places. Yeah. And seven, eight months on the job now. How yes. do you feel it's going? I, I feel it's going well. And uh, we're going to continue to work hard. Um, we're not slacking off by any means. It's been so exciting. And, and the feel, people, they, they were ready and so receptive of, of leadership. And so it, it's been a great partnership. Debbie Critchfield, Superintendent of Public Instruction. Thank you so much Thank for your you. time. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, up next on Viewpoint, law enforcement, firefighters, and the community rallied around an Ada County deputy who was badly hurt in the line of duty. How they did that and how his recovery is going.
So, DirecTV fumbled your Sunday football? Time to scoop and score with Dish. Save money and get better TV with more football from A-Plus Satellite, your Dish premier local retailer. Enjoy all your games in one place on one remote control with YouTube and Prime built in. Plus, for a limited time, get a $300 prepaid card when you switch from DirecTV to Dish. A-Plus Satellite offers local customer service for a hassle-free switch. Call A-Plus Satellite today or visit our showroom at Fairview and Eagle behind Krispy Kreme. Join us on Idaho Today, Thursdays at 1230 for HealthLink Idaho, a segment featuring educational topics on how to keep you and your family safe and healthy. HealthLink Idaho, Thursdays on Idaho Today, sponsored by the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. Is your credit score getting in the way of things you want to do? Personal loans through NetCredit help you borrow up to $10,000. So check your eligibility on netcredit.com today without affecting your credit score. You may even be able to build your credit history as you repay. NetCredit, a more personal, personal loan. Seniors are overpaying for life insurance, sometimes more than twice the monthly rate of what they could be paying. If you've bought a guaranteed acceptance plan, please pay close attention. A 60-year-old male pays almost $90 a month for less than $11,000 in coverage with a guaranteed acceptance plan. But Senior Life Insurance Company qualified him for $11,000 in whole life protection for less than $48 a month. That cut his monthly life insurance rate in half and saved him him over $500 a year. A 75-year-old female could save over $50 a month for more coverage by switching to Senior Life. That's a savings of over $600 a year. Call Senior Life now to compare your current policy and see how we could save you hundreds of dollars a year on your life insurance. We might even be able to help you get money back on your current overpriced policy. Stop overpaying for your life insurance. Call Senior Life Insurance Company now for your free quote. Finally today, a fundraiser brought firefighters and police together to support an Ada County Sheriff's deputy who was injured in the line of duty. Nearly four months ago, Deputy Todd Nelson was stabbed multiple times. He was responding to a call of a man walking on Interstate 84 near Eisenman Road. Deputies approached the man and Deputy Nelson grabbed the man's backpack. Investigators say that man swung around, grabbed Nelson and stabbed him multiple times as they fell on the ground. Deputy Nelson is still recovering. He's been rehabbing his knee and leg and likely has two surgeries still to undergo. Law enforcement, firefighters and the community came together on August 1st at the Texas Roadhouse in Meridian for the Battle of the Badges, a rib eating contest and luncheon fundraiser for Deputy Nelson. He and his family were there talking with other first responders and they were incredibly grateful for this show of support. It's been a process. I mean, mentally, physically and uh, and there's still a lot to, to go, but um, I've had like the love and support has just been amazing and it's really helped me uh, drive and, you know, progress and do better. And my rock here has been amazing. Uh, the group is planning to make this event an annual fundraiser for local firefighters and police officers injured on duties on duty, that is, and for charities that support them. That's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I hope you have a great Sunday.